Oh, my voice certainly is very gravelly today. <laughs> Hello and welcome to As It Comes, Life from a Musician's Point of View. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I hope you're doing all right. I'm starting to see life emerging from the cracks of lockdown, coinciding with a lovely spring here in the UK, so I'm feeling heartened hearing about more people I know getting vaccinated, dates being entered into the diary that might actually happen this year, and also seeing friends again at the pub. Who's been to the pub yet? Isn't it nice to see your friends? Remember laughing, chatting, and taking silly photos of each other? Also, remember hangovers and spending all your money? <laughs> oh. I hope everyone's having fun, but being responsible. I've certainly learnt my lesson from the weekend. It's like the whole world's turned 18 again. Anyway, enough about that. My guest for this episode is Charles Owen. He's an ambassador for Steinway UK, as well as professor for piano at Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London, and is a very accomplished concert pianist. I first came across Charles at the St. Indalian Festival in Cornwall back in 2014, and in subsequent years, as he'd often perform a concerto with the festival orchestra. The St. Indalian Church is pretty tiny, so it's always a challenge to fit a full-size symphony orchestra in there around a grand piano, utilising every nook and cranny on stage. And it's often a startling occasion when someone is playing a concerto about one and a half metres away from your face, so for this interaction instead, Charles joined me on a Zoom chat on the one-year anniversary of the UK lockdown. Have a listen to my chat with Charles. <laughs> Charles, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today on March the 23rd, which is the one year anniversary of lockdown here in the UK. Uh. <laughs> and I can't believe it's been a year already. So, you know, cast your mind back to a year ago. How mm -hmm. did you react when the pandemic was all kicking off? I was in far from home. Home is North London in Muswell Hill. Um, we're high up looking over the city here. I was way away in Penzance in Cornwall and had a last concert f um, for one of the music societies down there. And then all this was breaking. This was just about a week before lockdown was announced. Then whizzed up to Cardiff, where I'm a guest professor at the Royal Welsh Academy there of Music and Drama. Gave the masterclass. First time I saw a mask was one of, was somebody wearing one in the class. <laughs> and um, students were starting to peel off and the hotel was emptying. It was just that weird feeling, as I'm sure for everybody, yeah. as it was kicking in. And I remember getting on the train back from Cardiff to London and, you know, people coughing and sneezing and the, yet the train quite empty. And, and I think it was the lack of knowledge, the sense of panic in a way. So that was my run up to it. I was thrilled to get home feel cosy at home in my other half and just be settled back and not worried um, as it all kind of just emerged, didn't it? Just step yeah. by step. I yeah. mean, it felt apocalyptic, didn't it? I remember, you know, racing yeah. home after gigs and it's like, you need to go home right now. It's not safe yeah. to be out. And it just, it felt yeah. like we were in a zombie movie or something, didn't it? <laughs> Completely. And I think, I'm, I'm sure everyone would agree, you know, the pandemic's had so many different moods and waves in the last year. I mean, when I say pandemic, I mean the lockdown, obviously. It's the, the whole on and off experience, the, the re-emerging and then back in the hunkering down in the shell, you know, it's just back and forth all the time. So, yeah, just shock, really. I remember the first thing I did was get the upright piano tuned. I have an upright piano, a lovely Yamaha, which also has a silent system in the flat where I live in Muscle Hill. Um, and then I have two Steinway Grands who are they're locked together, interlocking, and they are housed nearby in East Finchley by a family friend, a lady in her early 80s. So you can probably guess what's coming. You know, last year she was told quite strictly by her children, no one is to come in the house. Not None of us are coming in. No cleaner, no child's coming to practice the piano in your house. So getting the upright piano tuned and ready for lockdown, the neighbours primed saying there would be some playing out loud. Um, not just working on headphones. So that was the beginning. And then the cancellation started to come in. And 
I think every single freelance performer will say the same. First, it was a sort of sense of disbelief. And then gradually you start to accept it and think, OK, well, when's that one going to come in? What's next? And there was a kind of grieving period for all the cancellations because, you know, we all hang on these concerts, these dates in our diary, uh, you know, red letter days, we're planning the repertoire, where we're going. And to see it all collapse like a pack of cards was... Yeah, it was just very difficult to cope yeah, with. Yeah, the disbelief. I remember in normal times, if you have a concert cancellation, it's pretty mm. devastating, isn't it? Yeah. And then all of a sudden to have weeks and months cancelled, I just yeah. remember, same as you, just shock initially. And then there is that acceptance of, well, everyone is literally in the same boat, which was very strange, I think. That was very strange, but also a great leveller. It didn't matter where you were in the profession. Be, be, I'm talking, I'm going to focus now on the performing arts. Um, right. Yep. You know, being an actor, a dancer, a musician, uh, wherever you were, every, whatever status you'd achieved in your career, it, it was mm. irrelevant. Everyone was in the same boat. So yep. that was, I actually think that that was kind of a salutary thing, a good thing in some ways. Mm. But I have to say, it's it's interesting, you know, as we're starting to emerge out of restrictions and lockdown, you know, for students and young graduates, you know, people who were coming out of conservatoires just when the pandemic hit, you know, what would you say to people in that situation now, coming out into an industry that doesn't really exist in the same way that it used to? It's very, very frightening. I'm a faculty at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in, in, here in London. And it, I think a lot, of, a lot of students and those graduating are kind of almost burying their heads in the reality. I mean, having said that, you can't compare it, but even pre-pandemic, graduating from any music college for, I would just hazard a guess of 98% of graduates, they're entering a frightening world mm. of trying to find their way, unless they've had some tremendous success, which and a lot of building blocks for a career in place. It's still a very, very fragile time. I personally, when I left the Royal College of Music um, 25 years ago, had to move back home to my parents' place for a few years, um, and they were far from London on the Welsh borders, Worcestershire. And that had pluses and minuses, but I just simply hadn't got the income to survive. So with that kind of background for the majority of graduates in the arts, then to have the pandemic on top, it's just beyond horrendous, and I really feel for them. But on a positive note, so many have turned it into something creative and, you know, countless examples of online filming, home videos, people thinking, what can I do to keep that part of my life, my performing life, safe? But an enormous amount of people and graduates had to take jobs or move back home. Yeah, absolutely. I've said this so many times on, on this podcast, but it's really harnessing that entrepreneurial spirit, accepting yeah. the reality of, okay, things are quite crap at the moment for my industry, but yeah. how can I use my skills to still forge a path in this really difficult climate? So you mentioned before that you started off the pandemic when things were kicking off in Cornwall. I think we've actually performed together at the St. Andelian Festival. Yes, I've been told about that. Yes. <laughs> I would have been a cellist like vaguely on your left while you're performing a concerto wedged in between a, a pulpit and many other cellists trying not to break my bow. What are your plans for the summer? Are you hoping to go back to Cornwall? So my two main Cornish connections are going to the St. Andelian Festival, which I was invited I think by Mark Padmore 10 years ago to to come there with our old friends and have given recitals together occasionally and then I've also been going for yeah, more than a quarter of a century to the International Musician Seminar at Prussia Cove on the other side of Cornwall so that's master classes in the spring and chamber music gathering where people of different generations meet uh, musicians and rehearse chamber music and perform so there's the Cornish element on the south with Prussia Cove in the north with Endelian. Endelian I've given I think a five concerto performances there Wonderful conductor, fantastic orchestra. I mean, it's we conductors. I work with different conductors, mainly mainly Martin Brabens and Ryan Wigglesworth, uh, who are both obviously phenomenal musicians, and they bring this c disparate collection of players in the orchestra together from very good amateurs, emerging young graduates to top professionals who lead sections in many of the finest British orchestras. 
they create the most fantastic atmosphere, as you know. The everyone is far from the crowds, apart from the crowd of all of us, of course. And it's in a magical place to make music, and a very, very unique place. Almost reminds me of, say, something like like Britain and Piers may have set up, or Imogen Holst, away from the crowds, lots of amateurs involved, and somewhere beautiful, where the music and the socialising and the shared sense of purpose come together. That's how I would describe it. Yeah, that's a really good description. It's definitely a very inspiring place and with lots of inspiring people. And it's interesting that you said before the word leveller, albeit in a completely different context. <laughs> but I think at Indalian, there is this feeling of it being quite level in, in the sense that you could be a young professional, but you're sharing a desk with you know, a top professional or a, an amateur from the States who's flown over. And there's a whole lot of different people coming together and playing this wonderful repertoire. And as a result, having a fantastic musical uh, experience. Do you reckon you'll go down to Cornwall, even if the festival's not running? This summer, no, I don't think so. Because um, first of all, many of the concerts that were cancelled last year have not all but many have been rescheduled for this summer i am going to be very very busy performing and traveling there are some major dates in europe um which but i don't know if they will happen it's even now things are so difficult and with the uh covid restrictions having to quarantine for a certain amount of days before and after i'm afraid that is making concert giving very, very challenging. It's very hard to plan. Yeah, I mean, I imagine if you were to have to go into quarantine for two weeks in a hotel, you wouldn't be able to practice because no. you wouldn't have a piano. I, I guess it's the same for a lot of athletes thinking about going to the Tokyo Olympics and thinking, how am I going to keep up my training if I'm stuck in this hotel room for 14 days? Completely. And there's a limit to what one can do in a hotel room as an athlete. I mean, the only thing they could, unless one hires in a piano or gets the organisers, I mean, I'm talking about electronic keyboard just to keep your fingers moving. But no, it's out of the same. question. I, it's not the same. And this is one downside to being a keyboard player, pianist, harpsichordist or such such like, is that we do need the instrument with us, which is not portable in the same way as other instruments. Again, it swings and roundabouts because the plus was during lockdown, we were able to play music complete. We didn't, we're not like a, a, an instrumentalist who needs to play with other instrumentalists. You know, there's a limit to how much so, great solo cello repertoire there is and solo violin or flute or what have you. There is a finite amount, whereas for the piano, there is an infinite amount. There is so much that you can do. There is so yeah. much you can do. So those are pluses and minuses of being a pianist on one. The, this is a major, major issue, this quarantine. And so you have a concert in Belgium. OK, so you meant to quarantine there. Then the next is in Switzerland the following week. Until the quarantine is lifted, I do not see how it's going to work practically. And it's. I think we've just got to all be very, very patient. Yeah, it's it's going to be a really long road coming out of this even if they enforce things like vaccination passports or whatever it's going to take a lot of cooperation from all the different ends for it to work a lot of musicians are just going to say this is just not worth the headache for an individual concert if you are an opera singer or a conductor and you have a major run of events somewhere then it's worth going to that hassle but if you've got say one or two isolated concerts in, a, in another country it's just too complicated yeah just takes too long so maybe lots of local gigs i suppose it's interesting that you were talking about um you know being able to play solo repertoire because in my household um, my husband's a double bass player but there's only so much cello and double bass yeah. repertoire you can yeah. play because... <laughs> so um, this is a call out for anyone who's composing for cello and double bass please let oh, me know very good <laughs> we've done the rossini many many times now yes you've had enough of it no i do understand <laughs> um, but it's great that you've got each other you know it's sort of low and lower in the pitch <laughs> very very grumbly and and it's kind of good that we don't have anyone living below us we're on the ground floor so speaking of local performances last summer when some of the restrictions were easing you were lucky enough to do a bit of performing at the Fidelio Cafe in London, which for people who don't know, Fidelio Cafe is a classical music themed cafe and performing space. Wonderful place. I got to go there quite a few times before the pandemic. How did that feel? You know, you hadn't performed in however many months and then here you are in the summer getting to perform. What was your experience of it? First of all, I'm incredibly grateful to Fidelio Cafe's organiser and founder, Rafaela Morales. It's a uh, 
conductor mm. and pianist. So I spent that first lockdown away from the grand pianos on the upright piano, and I immersed myself in three composers, Chopin, Liszt and Schumann. Don't know why, but they kind of called out to me. And I learned an enormous amount of repertoire by them, revised their repertoire, pieces of their repertoire, which I had learned when I was younger. And Raffaello got in touch and said to me, this is happening. And I remember standing on the street on my mobile, listening to the suggestion, thinking, how can this happen? This was in, say, May, I think he phoned me. And he said, who else was playing? So I thought, yeah, some great colleagues are playing. This must be real. So I gave a program, a selection of the repertoire I've been working on. I'd had one previous private concert when we were allowed socially distance in July out in um, Gloucestershire. And then walking out in front of the audience at the Fidelio Cafe, which is about 30 people, um, all seated at individual tables, either as a group of two or three. It felt amazing to actually share the sound of the piano in real time in real life um i ought to add that that actually the first live music i heard for well four months i think or so was at the fidelio cafe Stephen isolis playing bach's cello suites the g major oh, yeah to... i saw that advertised and i really wanted to go but i couldn't afford the tickets no, no. <laughs> so they would have been snapped up in like 30 seconds or something <laughs> it, it, Stephen Stephen did five the performance five times he did the first and third cello suites and some solo walton in the middle and it was incredibly moving to witness uh, the the audience you could feel the emotions the purity of that Bach in his incomparable hands started the music started to come and you know it's something we all took so for granted hearing music played by not just by ourselves obviously but by other people yeah. and it is such a different experience when you only hear yourself playing an instrument or singing. And then when you hear someone else playing and you're sitting back and listening and not on a screen, not on a recording, but in real life, it yeah. struck everyone anew. Agreed? Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And not only that, but also when you do get the chance to perform live, really witnessing the feedback that you get from yes, the audience yeah. in real time as well. It really drives home the point that it is a shared communal experience and that it's, you know, you're not performing just because this is a piece that I've learnt and I'm just going to play it now because this is what I do. But it's something that the audience is receiving and, and taking as well. Totally. And, and the other thing about the Fidelio, which is interesting, is that each artist who played in that first season played at least three or four times, repeated the programme. So same hall, same piano, different audience, but same music. It was the closest, in a way, an, a, a musician can get to an actor in theatre. Mm. Going back to that same venue, it's a very, very different feeling because, you know, people forget that, that, that musicians don't always, in fact, very rarely repeat the same programme a few nights in a row in the same venue. You know, it's true. They may take that programme on, on tour and to different venues and it's going to sound different from hall to hall, piano to piano. And that gives something different. Whereas yeah. being in the same venue was a really interesting experience for me. Yeah, so how did that feel? You know, did you have any really discernible differences from night to night? You know, performing the same repertoire, but obviously slightly different environment, different factors of chance. They were very different. Each of the performances, I, I felt different elements came out. Um, I should add that this was in August in searing temperatures. One of the, <laughs> some of the, one of the hottest weeks that we've ever had in London. And, and the cafe is in Clerkenwell and there's a busy road outside. And quite frankly, you have to have the windows and doors close when you play because you wouldn't be able to hear the music obviously the sound of revelers in the streets opposite yeah. but with the doors closed it's fine sound wise the intensity of that in this incredible heat i was wearing a very light shirt which i bought in vietnam a few years ago which was kind of designed to but even that each evening uh, luckily i've got a series of them they were totally as if someone had poured a bucket of water over me oh gross <laughs> so you're basically playing in a greenhouse with all those windows totally. and also because there are a lot of house plants in that cafe you actually would have felt like you were in a jungle <laughs> I really did. And, and I think there's actually uh, some filmed footage of one of the concerts that's on, on YouTube. And you can see people fanning themselves. And that was the coolest night of the three. <laughs> so anyway, I digress a little. Um, it, it, they, so the, that was that was a background constant, the, the, the extreme heat. But 
different friends would be in different nights. Some nights the audience felt just warmer, more giving. Others, I felt they were harder to connect or it was very interesting. Each night was different and each evening certain pieces felt maybe slightly stronger than others. It was fascinating being able to try, you know, you finish a recital and you think, oh, you know, I'm going to, I didn't do that section very well or something that went, I want to try something different there. And then you just think, got another chance tomorrow night. Oh. Let's do it. Yeah, it really does show how much an audience brings to a performance. And, and we need them back. Going forth, I mean, like, you know, we're, we're heading into spring now and going forth into summer. And they're saying that, fingers crossed, we'll be able to put on performances again from at the earliest May the 17th or something yes, like that. That's right, yeah. And, you know, what sort of changes are you looking forward to going ahead back into the console in the future after a year of seismic changes? It seems like it's a great opportunity for performance and for performers and concert givers and, and institutions to really change this approach to music making. What's something that you would like to see done differently well, I think, first of all, that I'm not such a huge fan of intervals during a recital. And I know this has been written about by my uh, friend Stephen Huff in the, recently in The Guardian. He, he talked about, you know, let's, let's get rid of intervals. Let's do an hour and a 15, an hour and 20 minutes. And, you know, there are plenty of operas where you have to sit through an hour and 20 minutes. And it would be better to do that, have people meet before the concert for a drink, and then more time afterwards... So I think that that's something I would like to see changed instead of, you know, 45 minutes, interval 45 minutes, I would like to see an hour and 15 minutes. And funnily enough, I have a birthday concert coming up at King's Place this summer. And that's what we're doing there in July. We haven't announced it yet, but we will shortly. The programme will go straight through and it will be about an hour and 15 to an hour and 20 maximum if there are any encores. So it's quite like a concentrated um, time to really focus isn't it for the audience and for the performance as well definitely um on this same subject i actually think that m wonderful and much loved as all our technology is for, let's be honest it's been a lifesaver for so many people but i think that the concentration required to sit in an auditorium or, or church or hall or wherever you're performing wherever theater or dance is done live performance and not be distracted by that need to look at a mobile or tablet or what have you, is a skill that some audience members will need to re reacquaint themselves with. Because I think people, and myself included, you know, I have to, when I'm reading a book, obviously I've read a huge amount in lockdown, I make sure that electronic devices are not next to me because it's so easy to reach out. And uh, when you're trying to concentrate, especially if you're reading something, uh, something serious, not something fluffy, you can't be distracted. And it's the same in concert halls. So I would like to see greater concentration from the public and hopefully that will come naturally as a result for this hunger for the live experience. But I think that that's something we need to protect in our digital world and especially as digital has dominated our lives now for over a year and with good reason. So, as you mentioned before, also you're a professor at Guildhall School of Music and Drama. How's the technology been for you teaching your students? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> I think I and thousands of colleagues could talk about this endlessly. The downsides are, so FaceTime and Zoom are used for lessons. Yeah. Uh, are the connection going at either end? Connection distorted, which means sometimes it sounds as if the piano is underwater. And then people playing quite normally and suddenly Zoom has it playing twice the speed have you come across that yourself actually have you seen there's a meme that went around social media last year and it was um the minuet from anna magdalena's book um written for zoom and it was just like yeah. you know huge pause and then everything just sped up in the last few bars i do remember it thank you for reminding me yeah exactly <laughs> it's that so that was a problem at, at times it really depended on the connection um and i think maybe some i could be talking rubbish but i think some computers or tablets are more compatible with each other <laughs> than yeah. others yeah i found very tiring always having to say which bar number, which beat, is that, have you got the third finger on that A, A flat there or are you using four? You know, and 
I can't do more than two or two, maximum three hours a day, probably two. It is absolutely exhausting. I, I 100% agree there because when you're teaching, you're having to vocalize so much more yes, of what you're doing. you are. Because when you're in person, you can just show them and you can like, like I'm, I'm showing here, look, third finger on whatever string. But then if you're explaining every single little thing and you've said like a billion things in 20 seconds when they could have just been playing. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Colleagues said to me, you're going to find it really tiring. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, of course not. And after the f first hour of ever doing online, I fell asleep on the sofa. And me from... <laughs> passed out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, passed I've, out. I've def definitely done the same thing. So have you been back to in-person teaching? Yes, I have. So, so the online teaching took place for the whole summer term and, and the remainder of the spring of last year. Yeah. We were in person during the autumn term, which was wonderful. It was just everything was going so well. In fact, I found everyone I coached had done so much more practice. I felt that each and every student had improved a lot. I'm afraid this time during the winter when we were back at home was a lot harder. Some students didn't even want to take online lessons. Some had just kind of given up almost, which is heartbreaking. Everyone was over it by that point. I mean, like, it, yeah. everyone kind of went into it last spring being like, okay, this is new. There was a slight sense of novelty. And then come January 2021, everyone was like, we should be over this. This is really really old <laughs> i agree with you and, and i think i think the winter and myself included i mean i worked incredibly hard in the last year and that's how i got through it super motivation massive of exercise this winter was much much harder i have re-emerged but i have given a concert but it was very hard for a while i just re restarted two weeks ago we at guildhall and all the other colleges opened again and I went in and it was so revealing. Many, many of the people that played to me this time had not improved. And a, a lot of bad habits had crept back into their playing, despite the online lessons. And there were so many things that I hadn't picked up on in the lessons for January and February, which I could instantaneously see and hear in person. Yeah, I mean, like, you can't even see a student's feet when you're teaching them. That's a problem I've had with teaching cello is I realized after a term that one of my students was on her tippy toes, basically. And of course, I wouldn't see that. But then you can fix that in a second when you're in the same room as them. You're totally right. And it's the same on the piano with the pedaling. That was the one issue I never spoke about pedaling in a single online lesson because you can't. I hardly referred to balance of sound in the, in the sophisticated way. I you couldn't. can't hear it. You can't hear no. it properly. No. And going back to registers and thinking of you and your husband as string players down in the depths, <laughs> the bass does not carry well on Zoom or FaceTime yeah. or the bass no, no. of the piano. So you know, I, I was giving a, a class for Eton College a few days ago online and I was saying, can you play with a richer bass? And the guy said, I really am trying. And I was demonstrating. <laughs> and then the head of piano said, well, your bass is faint as well. I think it's just Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just blame Zoom, blame Zoom. Yeah, the number of times where it's like a kid has played a two octave C major scale and then it, the sound kicks in in the second octave. And by the end of it, I'm like, well, the top octave was great, but I'm just going to trust that the bottom octave was good yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Anyway, all I would say is some of those online lessons were very enjoyable. And I think we all enjoyed seeing each other, um, just having that contact, especially during the first pandemic. Because it was a bit of a lifeline, I think, for a lot of the students as well. For them to yeah. be able to see someone outside of their household bubble, do something different and, uh, yeah, just be able to focus on something else. In a way, it's a form of mindfulness, I think. It, it really is. There are pluses and minuses to online teaching. Yeah. And I'm sure I will have to give some online lessons in the future, but I want them to be special occasions and not regular. Yeah, not the norm, yeah. <laughs> So you might be aware that I have a segment in my podcast called the Wild Card Question Round. And this is your opportunity to choose what I ask you next based on yeah. three topics that I present you. Okay. So the topics are hobbies, favorite concerts, and travel destinations. Oh, I think all three of those are heavenly. <laughs> <laughs> I love all of them, but I'm going to go with hobbies. So away from the piano... What do you like doing? Okay, well, lockdown's given lots of chances to explore such things. Of course, I've read a lot. I've finally been brave enough to read 19th century literature. Um, <laughs> Eliot and um, I've just started, but more like Dickens. 
I don't know why. I've just always been slightly nervous, thinking, oh, I won't be able to understand it. I've had, and I've also been listening on audio book, particularly mm. to Dickens. I love it when it's read by a, an actor and all the characters are brought to life. I've covered many other books, read far more about composers. And sometimes I find composers' biographies look quite intimidating. Yeah. But you know, as a professional musician who's been at it for a number of decades now, I really felt I wanted to use that time to read much more depth, really, really detailed about composers' lives and works. So tell me one composer's biography that you'd recommend from your time in lockdown. I would say, I'm looking at it now, uh, Jan Swafford's biography of Brahms. Okay. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, just particularly the way he paints the story of uh, you know, the young Brahms em- emerging from this family in Hamburg and working his way up from a very difficult upbringing into becoming one of the greatest composers of the 19th century. And also it's the kind of prejudice he was up against, social prejudice, I would say, how he was a very North German, Brahms, and how he had to actually leave the North of Germany and head to Vienna to kind of establish his identity and start his life there. It's interesting what you said about being slightly intimidated by 19th century literature. I've definitely felt that same thing. But I might try audiobooks, actually, because I definitely absorb information better when I'm listening to it rather than reading it on the paper. Sometimes the language used in, like, Dickens and stuff like that, I look at it and I just think... What? <laughs> I, I agree. And I would say, in a way, it's the same as Shakespeare. The moment it's read out loud. And I used to be a bit a bit of a snob about audiobooks, thinking, no, 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 this is not pure. But actually, I have really changed my mind with certain things. And with Shakespeare, you know, there's so much that you can do with the expression, the, in, the inflection. Totally. Like, when you see it written yeah. down, you, you don't really know how it's going to be read. But when it's read by a really good actor, you know, you get the, the dramatisation in all the verse and everything, it just makes so much more sense. Completely. I mean, and I think it's not quite the same parallel, but you could say when a musician is sitting looking at a score away from the instrument or they're not listening to a recording or at a concert, just silent, you can hear something, you can look at that score, you can hear something, obviously not the same as reading. But that's our purpose as musicians, as recreational musicians, is to bring that music to life for audiences as opposed to creating it. So that's our duty and destiny. That's so true. Otherwise, everyone would just sit at home with, with their scores out, just reading them. There is some... A little bit of a comparison there. So back to the hobby. So I, I've been doing that and I've been reading on many, many other subjects. So often I started a book in the past on a train journey, plane journey or holiday and then work has started up and I've not finished it. So I've been wrapping up all sorts of things. But other hobbies, I've come back to a childhood hobby, which is 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzles. Oh my gosh, you're you're the second podcast guest in a couple of weeks that has said that. I, I spoke to someone else recently who said, always got a 1,000 piece puzzle puzzle on the go and i'm afraid i have in my instagram feed's got some pictures of <laughs> oh really uh yeah it's be- and often they are works of art or even a painting which is not very well known but just it's fantastic to notice how the artist's brush moves yeah you see the piece of art differently when you're looking at it in that much detail you really do and i think also with if it's a reproduction of something painted on canvas or on board you can see the the way the grain of the wood that they've painted on is going so that's a great advantage when it's an extremely difficult piece you can sort of follow the grain you have these different strategies to get through it although i have to say one of the last puzzles i attempted to do a few years ago was an english heritage photo of whitby abbey up in yorkshire which i know beautiful I mean, amazing building, and we got the abbey done, but, you know, the rest of the photo, it was clouds, sky, and grass, and... Yeah, it was just, it was too much. We, we, we did the Abbey bit, but that was it. Good for you. I have to say, there's a, with a photograph, there really is, apart from the shape of the piece and the colours possibly, it's sometimes just not very rewarding. You think, why am I doing this? But the ones I've done have really lifted my spirits and I just loved getting to know each individual. I've, I've, I've done ones by Bruegel um, and uh, another one of Kandinsky, which funnily enough, I bought in New York at the Guggenheim about a year ago. It's the last time I left the UK. Also, I find this a parallel with classical music in that, especially let's just stick with piano music for a moment. You know, we've got many voices, many lines 
And we've got to unravel all that counterpoint. We've got to understand how the voices move. And so working on a piece of piano music is a little bit like assembling colours, textures and shapes in a jigsaw puzzle. And then taking it all apart, obviously putting it back together, making connections. So I see an extra musical yeah. element. I like that very, very much. Making sense of it all so that you get a whole big picture. I love that. Thank you so much for your answer to the wild card question round. You're welcome. Charles, thank you so much for joining me today, um, providing your insights on your experiences on the pandemic, performing over the summer and teaching as well as, as the wonderful parallels between puzzles and music making. <laughs> so where can people find out more about you and your work? I normally announce all the concerts that are coming um, on my homepage, which is uh, charlesowen.net. .net, okay. Because there's another Charles Owen and they make equestrian uh, uh, sports wear. <laughs> okay, well, so, exactly. So if you find a whole lot of equestrian equipment, you've gone to the wrong place. <laughs> Definitely. And, and funnily <laughs> enough, they're, so they're based up not far from Chester and I played at the Chester Festival a few years ago and they sponsored the concert. Oh, Charles That's Owen rather, sponsoring yeah. Charles Owen. Exactly. It's not... They make other things as well, I believe, luggage and, you know, sort of riding hats and, and we'll leave it there. So that's where I announced the concerts. Obviously, I've I had to delete a lot of concerts <laughs> which oh, were announced, yeah. but I have just put a few up for the summer, which are planned from June onwards. And there's a few TBCs, a few TBAs there, um, but I'm hoping to fill in all those gaps. So on my website, um, people can find out more about me on, um, obviously, there's some YouTube films and there'll be many more of those kind coming um, in the fullness of time. I've had various recitals filmed in the last year. Um, and of course, I'm on Instagram. For all the puzzle pics. <laughs> yes, the puzzle pics and a few <laughs> you know, a few links to concert. And I also, you know, I forgot to say during the pandemic, I did have some films done at home on the upright piano in those early days of lockdown, just a sort of morale booster. And you'd be amazed. At, I always thought I would never put out something like that of myself. I would only put out me playing in a concert at my very best on a beautiful grand piano in some lovely hall. But no, I wanted to show I'm at home. I'm interested yeah. in my T-shirt and I'm just playing bits of Liszt and Chopin and Schumann. And I've put those on Instagram. Yeah, it brings the audience closer to you, doesn't it? I mean, because I am yeah. the same, like I in the past would never put anything of myself playing online. But like, you know, for International Women's Day um, the other week, I put up a video of myself playing March of the Women by Ethel Smythe playing on cello and toothbrush. Excellent. So, right. I'm going to have to search that out when we hang up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me and thanks for being on the podcast. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. That was pianist Charles Owen. We mentioned Shakespeare in the chat, so I've been thinking about Shakespeare a bit recently because it was his birthday last week, the 23rd of April for those playing at home. That same date is also his date of death. Unlucky. Shakespeare lived through challenges that are not unfamiliar to us in the present day. In the early 1600s, London was hit by a series of bubonic plague outbreaks. Authorities suspected that the plague spread at mass gatherings, and because of this, theatres shut their doors and performers found themselves out of work, shielding at home, or fleeing to the countryside. Sound familiar? This time in quarantine resulted in one of Shakespeare's most productive periods of his life, where he produced well-known plays such as Anthony and Cleopatra, King Lear, and The Scottish Play. As society gradually trickled back into the theatres, albeit in smaller numbers, to try and reduce the risk of infection, it changed the way Shakespeare wrote certain scenes. Because plays were being held in venues of smaller capacities, he started creating scenes of a more intimate nature that wouldn't have been possible in larger venues. So I think about this past year and how much creativity has burst from the scenes of the pandemic. Future historians will be able to analyse the shifts in creativity and see how this was a turning point for future generations of artists. Even now, with the limited numbers of performances that are happening, the pandemic affects our choices of programming, layout, instrumentation, venue, many different factors, much in the same way Shakespeare adapted his craft to accommodate the times. 
Just ignore the fact that over the weekend there were 50,000 people at Eden Park in Auckland attending a concert by 660. New Zealand seems to be doing fine. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Big thanks to Charles for being my guest in this episode, as well as Jen at Premier Classical for her help. And as always, thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, you can support the podcast by buying me a coffee on my coffee page. Link is in the show notes. Your support is very much appreciated. Get in touch at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or on the website asitcomes.com where you'll also find all previous episodes and transcripts of the podcast. You can also get in touch with me via Instagram and Facebook where I highly recommend you give me a follow and a like at asitcomespod. Remember to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you to those who've already done so and thanks for continuing to spread the word. Chat to you soon and take good care. Bye. Thank you.